Good morning. Um, this morning's scripture is from the gospel according to Luke chapter 15, and we'll start at verse 11. So if you don't have a Bible, there's one under your seat. And if you don't have a Bible of your own, please feel free to keep the one there um, as our gift to you. So I'm going to start in Luke 15, uh, verse 11. And Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose, and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the father said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robes and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called to one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. And when this your son came, who had devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It is fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. This is God's word. Yeah. I'm trying to understand this big story called the Bible. I've tried to approach it in three different ways that I've found pretty helpful in my life. Uh, that is, the Bible is the window, the Bible is a painting, and the Bible is a mirror. So when I say the Bible is a window, I'm thinking about how we look out of a window, a big panoramic view, and we see something maybe foreign to our lives, and that's what we do with the Bible. We're looking through a window, seeing something for the first time, make, maybe take a couple mental notes along the way. Another way to see the Bible, though, is as a painting. If you were to walk into an art gallery, we go from just seeing a scene to trying to be smarter about it, right? That's why we all sit there. <laughs> we look at the little placards, right? We try to like act well, you know, like we know what's going on in the painting. Maybe say something to someone next to you. You start to notice relationships, patterns, uh, comparisons, contrasts in the painting and that sort of thing. Because doing this helps us not miss the main point of what the artist is trying to create. Same thing with the Bible. You'll notice relationships, similar words going on, this sort of thing. And that's what we usually do when we call it Bible study. But a third way to read the Bible is the Bible as a mirror. And the idea behind this is that the Bible was written not only for them, it was written for us. So it's not just their story, it's our story also. And we are meant to put it up to our face as a kind of mirror. I've tried to show this to us each week in our series, My Role in God's Story, but perhaps nowhere more does God clearly hold up a mirror than in this telling 
that Jesus tells of the story of a prodigal son, this parable, the story that Jesus tells, is the third of three stories. And at this point, it becomes clear that at this point in the big story, something new is happening because lots of sort of unexpected, irreligious kind of people are coming up to this prophet and teacher named Jesus wanting to know more about God because he's teaching about a new way to relate to him. So he tells them these, these related stories called parables, and the third one acts as a mirror for us. Now, for those of you who were here last week, you might remember that we saw ourselves in a man named uh, King Jehoshaphat, who in the Old Testament, it was, it was a righteous man, but he was flawed. And God helped him, but he didn't help him as much as he helps people now through Jesus, right? And so Jehoshaphat experienced what we now can acknowledge in ourselves, which is this sort of deep inability to constantly do right and to change deep down. Because there's something called sin in our lives. There's this big no in our hearts where we just can't continually do what is right. And Jesus uses this story today in Luke 15, this gripping story, to tell us our two most common responses to this frustration of not being able to do what's right and what's good. A younger brother and an older brother. And in these two, Jesus means to hold up to us a mirror and see ourselves. Okay, so the first role in God's story, my first role in his story is to find myself. To find myself. To find myself either in the younger brother or the older brother. And having the courage to admit, I'm kind of like one of these. So first, let's start with the younger brother. The younger brother distanced himself from the father to become uh, let's say is self-ruled. He asked his father for his share of the property, verse 12, and he divided his property between them. The word for property here, the phrase for property, is tone beyond, which literally means his life. In this totally agrarian society in which Jesus taught this, a man's life was tied to his property in a way that maybe a third or fourth generation Petaluma egg dairy chicken farmer can understand, right? My life is tied to this piece of land. Property in Jewish culture would be delved out, divvied out after the father's death. And it's very clear in God's law that the youngest son would receive half the share of the older son. So in total, that would be a third. If you have to do the hard math in your head, it took me a while just to do fractions and finally figured out that's a third, right? third of the total estate. And the request of the property ahead of time from the father, this request that the sons makes is absolutely detestable. It's the equivalent of looking the father in the eye and saying, I want your life so that I can go live mine. That's what it's like. I know of someone who shared this parable uh, when they were in Cambodia and they asked the audience how they would have responded, how, how a father in that society would have responded, a Cambodian man, to this request of a son. And they said he would have been summarily beaten. <laughs> and not only that, if wealthy, the father would have taken out an ad in the local paper in which he formally would have disowned his son and announced it to the whole community. Something like this would have been expected from the father of our story, but instead... This father would rather have kids who make decisions on their own, who have the freedom to make decisions on their own, even if it's the wrong one, even if it breaks their heart. And it turns out he wants to be loved freely, not just because he's there and living in his own household. So the younger son, more than anything else, he wants this self-rule in his life. He wants out of the father's house, out of the, the father's uh, shadow, out of his brother's shadow, wants his own sense of freedom because that's what he feels freedom will be when he's autonomous. But like a fish wanting to get out of water, that's the kind of freedom that the son experiences, right? If I just get out of this, I'll be free. So he goes on a bender. He recklessly wastes his father's life, his wife on himself. And that's what prodigal means. It means to be extravagantly wasteful. 
And so he goes and spends it all and pretty quickly. And Jesus is trying to describe here the futility of that big no in our heart called sin when we just can't get it right and we can't do right no matter how hard we try. One response is to give up. This boy feels like he can never please his dad, so he might as well just please himself. So he leaves the security and the love of his home. And how does it play out? He experiences a famine. A famine hits, and it always does, right? Hard times are God's sort of subwoofers to get our attention in life. A lot of people make the mistake of pitting this story as one of uh, a lazy brother versus a disciplined brother, a, a wanderer versus a worker. But that's not fair, really, right? The the younger son doesn't resort to welfare when things go bad. He actually works hard, only it's for pig feed, right? Then he goes on to this well-conceived restitution plan, all the while wondering, how in the heck am I going to pay back my father for wasting his very life? Now, when I first heard this parable, I thought, man, the older brother... He was so close, right? So close to being able to make this a happy ending if he just gave up his pride for a moment, laid it down and went to the party and celebrate with his brother. All would be well, but it was a very naive way of thinking about this whole story. It was never going to happen. The older brother drifted far further from the father than just one decision of whether to go back to a party or not. Younger son, even when he asks his dad for, to essentially take his life, at least he addresses his father as such in verse 11. The older son, notice what he says. His first words are, look, these many years. He doesn't even say his dad's name. He doesn't even address his brother as such. Let's look at verse 30. When this son of yours came. And what we notice is a heart that's very far from his family and has been far from his family for a long time. If the younger brother wasted his father's life, the older brother wasted the father himself. His his nearness, he wasted. You never gave me a young goat, he said. And based on the father's later reply that "All all, all I have is yours, it becomes clear. It's because he never asked. He never asked. He never drew near enough to the father to ask him for a goat, to celebrate with his friends. Remember the second part of the younger brother's prepared speech? He doesn't get to it when he says it to the father, but he prepares it ahead of time to to treat me like one of your servants. Notice how the older son echoes this in verse 29. These many years I have served you. The word there for serve, do loss, literally means slave. In other words, I've slaved for you. The kind of thing a bitter son says, right? And exaggerates. Because he's always been a servant and never a son. He's service ruled, sp- spending his life laboring as a servant, trying to earn what could only be given and had already been given to him. So he gets angry as a result at this lavish display of grace. Why would someone get angry at something so wonderful as a, as a free gift? And the main reason is that grace delivers us into the immediate favor and presence of God. As long as you can say, God, you owe me, right? That each week I show up for worship, I tithe, I give to charity, at least I'm better than my younger brother. As long as we say that, you kind of owe me that we can keep the father at arm's length, can't we? You can keep him at arm's length and yet expect his blessings because he owes us that. My question is, do you see yourself in the older son? You serve well, especially compared with other people. You expect God to answer your prayer. Right? You're, you keep your family, maybe your marriage together. And you've generally led a pretty good life. And in doing so, you can stay distant from your dad, your heavenly father. And that's by design. 
The irony is both kids keep their dad at arm's length, one through self-rule and the other not through badness, but actually through his goodness, through the good life that he leads. You can stay out in the field, keep working away at life and never know what it means to celebrate being with your dad and knowing him. So which one is you? Having, having held up a mirror, part of what we have to do here is admit I'm either a self-ruled person or I'm a service-ruled person. Am I a younger brother or an elder brother? Have I found myself in this story? But that's not the only thing keeping the father at arm's length, which leads me to, this, to my second role in God's story, which is to find the father. So find myself, but also find the father in this story. Later, later in Luke's gospel, Jesus is going to tell another parable called the parable of the minus or talents. It's a story that's focused on one particular man who receives money from his master, but he doesn't use it or invest it at all. And he tells us the reason why. He says, I was afraid of you because you are a severe man. You take what you didn't deposit, you reap what you did not sow. And that's how the younger and older brother view their father as a severe man. They're afraid. He doesn't give goats and you deprive me of living. And maybe you've thought the same about God, that he's this inflexible, inscrutable ruler who only does what's beneficial to him. That's my idea of God. And that's one of the reasons Jesus came to this earth. In John chapter 1, we're told that Jesus came to translate who God is to us. All right, so he actually spends his entire ministry then relating to his God as Father and calling him this as a result. In fact, when we catch Jesus in one moment, the, the gospel writers actually translate Jesus talking in his native Aramaic speech. And in that moment, we hear Jesus call his dad, Abba. Now to understand how, what a big deal this is, Jesus grew up like every Jew saying the same prayer every morning, the Shema from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength. And like Jews, every Jew at this time, he would take great care in even pronouncing God's name. The Jewish people didn't say or write out the name of Yahweh, God, but they would abbreviate the name by shortening it when speaking it. So when you say hallelujah in a song, that Yah is short for Yahweh, but it's not the whole thing. Or they would say Adonai, substitute a name for him. Or when they'd write it out, they would leave out the vowels and say Y-H-W-H. And why do this? Because God is so other than us. He's so unfamiliar and transcendent from us. So for Jesus to call the creator Abba, it was scandalous. Because this was a, a way for a small child to speak to their dad, a colloquial way. So when a father would come home from work, a four-year-old kid would say, Abba, Abba, when they would go into their parents' bedroom in the morning and jump on their bed, they'd say, they'd say Abba, Abba, as they jumped, right? It had this, this way of rolling off the tongue, basic symbol, uh, syllables in the same way kids today would say, Dada. And Jesus was teaching that we can know God as Abba in this intimate, safe, carefree, happily dependent relationship. Jesus came to translate this God to us. How wonderful is that? And more than anything else, grace characterizes this relationship with one's Abba. And grace can be defined, I like to define grace like this. Grace is love made active through an undeserved gift. Here's a dad who doesn't just love his child, but he acts on it. And we see that in the story with five life-altering verbs. If you look at verse 20, right? While he was still a long way off, the father saw him. So first saw, the father was looking for him, sitting on the porch every day, watching in the far distance for his son to come home. The next thing we read is he felt compassion for him, which is my favorite Greek word ever to pronounce, splachnazo. I just love to say splachnazo. It just feels like something I would have seen on Nickelodeon as a kid. That's an old reference that you might not know. That's okay, but it means producing a longing from the bowels, and that's what the father felt about his son. 
I want to paint this picture for you of what the son would have faced when he slinked into town. He would have done so through one entrance, one gate into a city. And when you came into a city, all the houses would be close together, meaning everyone would have stopped to watch this boy who dared come home, had the nerve to return. He looks like a shell of his former self, right? He's, he's skinny from hunger. He smells like pig slop, right? His, his head is down from shame. He would have thought that the villagers were going to at least insult him, maybe even a couple of them reach out to, to actually beat him, to strike at him, and to find his father about his business. But wait, could it be? There's my dad now, and he ran to me. He ran to me. One scholar notes that, quote, it's safe to assume that he has not run anywhere for 40 years, this father, and now he races. And to do so, he's got to actually take the front edge of his robe up like a teenager. And when he does this, his legs show in what is considered a humiliating posture because he knows what his son's going to face in the village. So what does he do? He takes the shame and humiliation on himself so that his son doesn't have to face it. That's something you may not, may not realize as the father's running out there. He is deflecting the shame. He is absorbing the shame and humiliation upon himself so his son doesn't have to realize it. So he runs and he embraces and he kisses. And I'm not even getting to the fatted calf and the ring and those things which he lavishes on his son. Jesus offers to us a relationship with our Abba. That is what he gives to us. So when we're confronted with this possibility, younger brothers have to ask the question, would I rather belong or be free? Free. Would I rather belong or be free? Of course, it's an illusion of freedom. We know this, the thing that we start to rule begins to rule us. So it is for everyone who begins to seek freedom from God, we give ourselves over to lesser pleasures that we think we're ruling. Then they begin to rule us until we experience the law of diminishing returns. They no longer satisfy us. And then we try to move on to something else unless we become addicted to them. Right? And so whether it's money, sex, influence, success, the success of our children, right? Sometimes very good things, food, hobbies, other lesser pleasures, thinking that they'll satisfy us. And the father is saying, come home to me at my right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now the older sons have to ask the question, would I rather be loved or be right? Would I rather be loved or be right? So this parable is actually the last in a series of three Right? And there's one about a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. And if you look down at the first two verses, we'll see the reason Jesus tells these parables. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees, that is the religious people, especially religious people, the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and he eats with them. And to eat with someone was to accept them, to say, I accept you into my life. You are worthy to eat with me. And Jesus tells this parable more than for older brothers than he does for the younger ones, for lost sons. And so in our story, when the father goes out to the older son, he risks humiliation also because he's leaving all his guests behind. It was considered very rude, but it doesn't matter to the father because he has another lost son. And that's all that matters to him. So he goes out to him. Son, you were all Ways with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. Some of us hear that, and we don't like it. God, we don't like the fact that God forgives time and time again because of Jesus. Is that you? Is that you out there working in the field, laboring, working, deserving, taking solace because you know you're in the right? The Father is reaching out to you also and saying, come home. I don't want you to be just your God. I want to be your Abba. Can you not see that you're my lost son, my lost daughter also? And I want that kind of relationship with you. And I know older brothers often cry out, well, how is this fair? How is it fitting to celebrate and be glad when so much was squandered? And I understand fairness is a, is a fair point. So I want to get to that with my last role here. My third role in God's story 
is to find others. My third role in God's story is to find others. You may have noticed that the role of Jesus is conspicuously absent from the story he tells. It's noticeably absent on purpose. Remember I said this parable is the, is the third in a series of three. Lost sheep, lost coin, lost son. Something is lost in each of the three parables. In the first parable, a shepherd searches for a lost sheep. And when he finds it, he puts it on his shoulders and people celebrate. They're glad. Angels celebrate. Then there's a lost coin. A woman goes and she searches all over the house for this lost coin. And when she finds it, she throws a party. But what's different with the third parable? Did you notice? No one goes out to search for the lost son. It's interesting, right? There's searching in the first one, searching in the second one. There's no one searching in the third one. Jesus is inviting his listeners to ask, where's the search party? Who is the most likely candidate to go out and search for this lost son? Well, the, the late Edmund Clowney tells a story of a, of a young U.S. soldier who uh, went missing in action during the, the Vietnam War. And when his family didn't, uh, didn't get word through official channels of his whereabouts, the older brother actually flew to Vietnam, risked his life searching in the jungles and the battlefields looking for his younger brother. It was said that um, despite the danger, he was never hurt because actually both sides of the conflict heard about his dedication and respected the quest on both sides of the conflict. Some of them called him simply the brother. In this parable, the older brother is the obvious choice to go and search for the younger brother. He would have had to do so at great expense. Remember, the father already divided up the property. So the younger brother technically has the money, but he is not willing to spend one cent on this despicable sinner who has run away from the family. Jesus does not put a true older brother in this story. One who's willing to pay the price to, to search for and save what's lost. By putting a flawed other older brother in the story, Jesus is inviting us to, to imagine and long for a true older brother who would do that one who's righteous and radically forgiving, one who, who lives a just life but mercifully uses that justice to spend himself to help someone else. Jesus is that true older brother, friends. Jesus is our true older brother. The one who's absent from this story we can find in Jesus Christ. To make it fair, Jesus put aside all dignity, all privilege, all power to spend himself to save us. It says in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, though for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. Jesus gave up his share of the property, his inheritance, his, his tone beyond, his life, to give us life. See? He is that true older brother. And for all of you who trust Jesus, more than yourself and more than your service, the true older brother has found you. He found you so you could be restored forever to your family and to a father who loves you, your Abba. He also found you so that you can find others. Jesus is the true older brother so we can imitate him and then go out and find other brothers. Jesus is a true older brother, so we can imitate him and then go out and find other brothers. If you were to keep on reading in Luke, the very next words Jesus tells is yet another parable. It's a strange parable about a, a money manager who's about to get fired. So he, so he uses money, literally savings, to help him make friends for when after he's fired. And Jesus' main point of this next parable is to spend money to build friendships for the sake of making good news connections with other people. Spend your money to make good news connections with them. Jesus immediately follows up the prodigal story with this one because he's saying to his disciples, act like me, a true older brother who spends himself to bring lost brothers back. 
Friends, let us respond by doing likewise. Pray with me if you would. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for telling this story. I pray that we have, if we, if we've identified ourselves either in the younger brother who sought freedom or in the older brother who sought to be right but keep you at a distance. Whoever we are, that we would find you, our true Father. Thanks for revealing, Jesus, who the true Father really is in this story a father who ran, had compassion, was looking for us, wants to invite us back into the family that we might celebrate with him forever and find true pleasures forevermore. We're thankful also for the true older brother, you, Jesus, who came to seek out and search for what was lost in us. Thank you for spending yourself to the uttermost on the cross that we might have life with the Father. I pray for those who need to come home today. If that's you, that you would take that first step. That's all that's needed is just to turn around and look again to the Father who wants to love you and embrace you again. Thank you for waiting for us and always willing to welcome us home. It's in Jesus' name we are able to pray this. Our true older brother, amen.